Welcome to the stream, everybody. Uh, this is Theory Underground. I am your host, David McCarricker, and um, this. Some people will be watching this in the future out of context, and that's totally okay because this conversation is a standalone conversation. But the the context of it, uh, our being in the world, in a sense, is one of uh, what I've been doing a live stream here for eleven hours and 28 minutes and uh, we're about to go for another hour and a half so that's good because honestly this is easier for me than other ways of doing things like the editing hole that I was in making those Gigic 101 and Lacan 101 things for the Theory Underground launch the, the original launch before the course site launch so the course site launch we haven't talked too much about it but basically Theory Underground is not just like a social media app, it's, it's specifically a course gated social media app, meaning that the forums uh, are kind of exist under the presupposition that the people involved have a commitment to tackling certain texts, to being engaged with certain thinkers, to trying to understand and see the world through certain concepts. And the person I'm bringing on for this conversation is Nick Casalucci. Is that right? Did I say it right? Yes. Okay. Nick Castellucci is one half of the Vanishing Mediators, formerly known as K Voy. Uh, he also goes by Free Beer Tomorrow on Instagram and other places where you might have seen his memes. But he's most well known for the work he has done with his friend and fellow traveler, my friend and fellow traveler as well, Andrew Flores, aka Master Signified Bodies, aka the Big Signorelli, aka each of you being one fourth of the young Zizekians, or I guess the two of you compose one half of the young Zizekians. I can even math right now. Um, so I just wanted to like ask you, where where are you coming from? Your being in the world, you've been up since six a.m. What are you What, what are you doing? <laughs> in general, in the abstract, right now, the whole thing. Yeah, today. Like, what kind of a day are you having? today um it's been something of a whirlwind very um pinocchio focused i've been teaching pinocchio all day that's For not real? a joke um yeah i read pinocchio condensed version to uh first grade uh, kindergarten, we had a test for second grade. It was not about Pinocchio. Um, it was about animals in Italian. And, um, and then for third and fourth grade, we watched the latest Pinocchio, but not the Guillermo del Toro version, because I'm not sure that they're ready for that. So uh -oh. that's been my day. So this is quite a, you know, shift. In focus from Pinocchio to Heidegger, but maybe there's some through lines there. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure Jordan Peterson could find it. Right, he has a lot to say about <laughs> Pinocchio, doesn't he? Okay, uh, all unions do. Yeah, no, like uh, any great myth, they're gonna they're gonna fanboy for it, you know. Which is great. It's true, you know. Like it's good to think about these things through philosophical lenses. I'm not trying to dunk on that, but anyway, so. The other kind of where you're coming from right now is, yeah, what, so you've been doing stuff with, uh, with Andrew, what have you been working on recently? Do you want to say anything about your channel before we really dive into what we're doing? Cause obviously you're not, your background is not being in time. Your background is not Martin Heidegger. Um, part of the question is like, why the fuck are you wanting to read it? Why do you want to be sort of like the, the pupil supposed to be confused, but actually doing the readings all summer? in this dynamic like wh why why what's wrong with you yeah what is wrong with me indeed i mean to what is wrong with anyone who wants to take a deep dive into lacan and zizek to begin with but then to add heidegger to the mix you really have to be uh far gone but a little bit about uh me and andrew's channel we are of two weeks ago i think maybe three the Vanishing Mediators, as you said, formerly known as Kevoy, we are 
steadily working through uh, the seminars. I don't think it's our plan to do every seminar. Sorry, the seminars of Jacques Lacan, I should say, the psychoanalytic thinker. <laughs> and uh, we've also um, taken on some exegetical readings to help uh, supplement the Mikey's or they know not what they do course. And we're really into it as a concept. Um, we want to do some other exegetical readings. We, we've we been thinking about doing some chapters of Ethics of the Real by Zupancic, Alenka, um, because that, that book isn't isn't talked as about as much as uh, What is Sex? So you, we're going to do a chapter of that related to the optical schema sometime in the future. Ah. That's just a little bit about the channel. It's called The Vanishing Mediator... Or, the yes the vanishing mediators i should know the name of my own channel you can check it out please subscribe um why heidegger why take this on well i feel that at this point the vanishing mediator let's say of many of the concepts that i've been working with Zizekian, Lacanian, would be Heidegger. Is Heidegger's, if we want to call it this, phenomenology, his unique approach to the question of being? Um, I've dabbled. I have watched some videos. Uh, I've benefited the most from watching um, Brian Becker's series on Heidegger. I believe he's going to be on Tomorrow, is that right? You're going to be talking about intentionality? Oh, yeah. Not only oh, is yeah. Brian Becker joining us tomorrow to talk about who's surreal and intentionality and the, the relevance of that for philosophy in general, but specifically its influence on Heidegger and Lacan. But after that, like a little bit later, I'll be like, uh, we will be joined by, uh, let me actually show it here on the screen for people, um, Samuel Loncar. He's not very well known. Um, he's a professor at Yale. Uh, he's, he's a younger professor at Yale who's doing stuff online and, uh, he will be on right after Brian Becker. So it's going to be Ashley Frowley to talk about the family, Brian Becker to talk about intentionality, and then Samuel Loncar to talk about being in time and philosophy as a form of psychotherapy. So it's going to be like phenomenology heavy these first few hours. Awesome. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm actually excited to be approaching someone as monumental as Heidegger from a, a the stance of a novice. Not that I'm not a novice when it comes to Lacan, but now that like I, I've been talking Lacan for a while, I want to once again be 100% confused, disoriented. Uh, I think it was... Uh, maybe Adam or Nance earlier just talking about kind of the humbling and also like equally thrilling experience of just like not quite being able to gain your bearings when it comes to a text, but also jumping right in at the same time and like being uncomfortable, being comfortable with being uncomfortable basically with a text. Mm. And, um, I think with, with Heidegger, as I said before, it's sort of like his concepts are the vanishing mediator here in that we know that Lacan was early in his career, or at least in the early seminars, very influenced by Heidegger. He famously says in seminar two in one of the lectures, eat your design, um, and Declare. I think there are a lot of homologies, maybe, or just parallels between phenomenology and what's going on in psychoanalysis. But I'm more interested to learn about how, um, where, where the crucial distinctions lie. Although on the surface, there might seem to be many, many different um significant parallels between these two forms of thinking but they're operating 
very differently. There's a they're kindred, but operating very differently. And I'm interested to figure out exactly how. For us, by us, I mean Lacanians, me and Andrew. Uh, I think Mikey would agree with this. The the register of the imaginary, the Bromian knot of the imaginary, symbolic and the real. A lot of what pertains to phenomenology happens within the imaginary. And I feel like, maybe without deep, going too deep into what the imaginary is, basically just immediate experience. Um, I feel like I have been confusing at times what Lacan does for a kind of phenomenology, which although he's influenced by Heidegger, we can't say that his, his theory is phenomenology. It's very different. So that just begs the question, all right, so then what is phenomenology? I don't have the clearest definition. I just have some notions, some inklings, and I'm really looking forward to testing those notions, developing them. Yeah, I'm going to want to ask Brian tomorrow if he agrees with that statement that um, Lacan is one, not doing phenomenology, and two, that um, phenomenology is primarily dealing with the imaginary. Because I, I think the, I th my my gut here, and it's not just like off the cuff. Like my gut from having wondered about this for a while, is that the phenomenological approach. Um, is taken into the clinic by Lacan and that there's just certain things that you cannot see if you merely do phenomenology from the first person standpoint and that you actually need the other person. You, you have to be doing analysis on a lot of other people and it's really it's, 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 it's phenomenology of the dynamic that is occurring between you and these others. And so now maybe that's wrong, but um, I think that also, this is not my own idea. I know Mikey's going to be like, that's my idea. It's true. It's Mikey's idea. Mikey has said something along those lines. Um, I hope that uh, someone doesn't steal his idea and then Mikey blames me for letting it out the cage there. But that I can't think about it like different than that. And so hopefully we'll, we'll get to hear from him on this and maybe I'm doing him an injustice. And maybe, maybe that's not actually his position. We need clarity now. But um, not only is, is that my hunch, but also... Uh, the phenomenology is like, it's the term that throws people off. Oh, it's dealing with appearances. I think when you get into chapter two of history, of the concept of time, which is this text right here, which we will be hopefully talking about a couple of times in the month of May in preparation for the launch of the being in time course in June. Husserl is, his starting point is appearances, but also like, everybody's starting point is appearances. But the point is to get beyond appearances and to deduce from appearances structures, like general structures. And some of these, and the, 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 the phenomenological attitude or spirit or goal is to, you know, it's famous that, you know, he always said, back to the things themselves, right? Like this is the, the motto of phenomenology from Husserl. Um, but where that comes from is his uh, mentor, Brentano, who was also a, a teacher to Freud. And so both Freud and Husserl learned from Brentano that psychology up until their time had been borrowing its concepts willy-nilly and heavy-handedly from other fields – and those are fields that are opened up to consciousness and to various kinds of acts that are, you know, in search of knowledge, right? But those fields are, you know, they only really get underway once they stop borrowing their concepts from other fields and develop concepts that actually do their utmost to map whatever the subject matter is in that field, right? Right. And so 
if you're borrowing concepts from biology and importing those into psychology, or if you're borrowing concepts from physics and you're importing those into psychology, and you're not doing so in a, in a very uh, self-critical manner while doing so, it's not scientific. And this was Brentano's fundamental focus. Now, Aristotle and the scholastics, they knew about intentionality to some degree. Um, they, they, they realize that they're, we don't have an experience of an objective world. We have an experience of experiencing a world, right? This is a fundamental problem for, lo for philosophy, and you don't get out of it by just saying, well, are we in the matrix or are we in the dream of the evil demon? I don't know. Am I a butterfly? And it's like this whole thing that people do. It's like this script where it's like they don't take it seriously, but it's like, no, no, no. We don't know what the world is to bats. We know what the world is to humans. Right. More importantly, it, this is kind of to the concept of gaze and Lacan. We don't just go around and see things in like some kind of a neutral manner. We things are lit up. And really, in a sense, like the things that fascinate us, they're pointing at us in this sense. Like our unconscious, we learn about our unconscious and others know about our unconscious, too, by the things that we're seeing, by the things that we're focusing on, by what gets us excited by, you know. And so this is. Um, this is sort of the, the bedrock idea behind intentionality. Um, and there's other, you know, essential ideas like categorical intuition, the original sense of the a priori, bracketing, these other kinds of fundamental things for phenomenology. Um, but the point is, is to not stay at the level of appearances. If people, contemporary academia has interpreted phenomenology as Let's just try not to think, let's try not to be biased. Let's try to look at the things and just interpret them to the best of our ability. But obviously, if you're doing that without a rigorous sort of uh, approach that does its utmost to, to say, well, what are we bracketing? What should we be bracketing? Why should we be bracketing it? Which, and bracketing means like uh, taking, t taking certain presuppositions or things that you've assumed and like, taking those out of the picture, right? Like, uh, for instance, subject-object dualism, um, thinking of consciousness as uh, fundamentally opposed to objects in the world. Like, that. Husserl does this to some degree. Heidegger's going to say he never went far enough. But the basic point is, is like, you're importing epistemological and metaphysical baggage into the analysis when you're doing that. And so... Um, there is no such thing as a pure encounter with the things themselves, right? Now, one of the things I, I've, I think Mikey has said on stream before is that uh, one of the detriments of phenomenology is if you bracket out too many concepts eventually, like you're not having an unmediated experience with the things themselves. And I would say Husserl is very aware of that. Heidegger is also aware of that. The, the point is never to, oh, now I've had this genuine brush up with the things themselves and now I can you know, describe them and then we can encode that into a new doctrine. It's the point is not a doctrine. Like the point is a series of, I almost want to call them thought experiments, but they're more like ways of seeing. And they're ways of seeing that very methodically take certain things that we've taken for granted and put those on ice, right? And so I do think that uh, Lacan would never, I, this is my own, at this point, I don't know if Brian will agree with me because it's part of why I want to bring him on is to talk about this. But I don't think that Lacan would have had the richness of insight that he did when going to the to bringing Freud into the 21st century um, without phenomenological ways of looking. And it's not just ways of looking, but it's specifically like taking what has made itself manifest and then saying, OK, instead of fixating on that and just describing that. What can we deduce from that in a generalizing way? Are there laws that we can come to? And these are laws, can, are there laws that we can come to and through these concepts that are from the actual phenomenon and the mechanisms that we perceive in conscious interactions and experience itself? That's the question. It, it, when we say back to the things themselves, the point is, can we get not get an original insight of the actual authentic real original experience um though of course like that's a great goal like why not try um but specifically 
are the, can we develop concepts that aren't just hand-me-downs from the thrift right. store of science, right? And so this is why the history of the concept of time starts out with the distinction between the sciences of nature and the sciences of the humanities uh, or social science versus um, what nowadays we'd call hard science. He says, uh, I think it's called, yeah, nature and history as domains of objects for the sciences, right? And so the tendency with Dilthey and with um, uh, Husserl and Brentano, as, as well as Scheller, Scheller, Scheller um, all of these people who were aware that uh, the humanities were making themselves the little handmaidens of hand-me-down clothes to the sciences and not developing their own discipline, right? Um, they were aware of this, but what Heidegger's going to say is what they, what they failed to do was to get back before the split between natural science and, hum and, and social sciences because there are things in common between the two and the concepts we should be using to think about them are not the concepts of physics. They're not the concepts of biology. They're not the concepts of astros. No, it, th the concepts for making sense of the split are going to be not just merely ones relegated to the sphere of the humanities either, but instead you go back, for Heidegger, you go back to the who's asking the question. Who's asking the question in the first place? Who's made the split in the first place? Who perceives and thinks through and projects this split onto everything all of the time, all day, every day? Humans are doing it. But specifically, Dasein is doing it. We have to bracket out human because human comes with the baggage of spirit, rational animal, soul, made in the image of God. All of these things that he's going to, at the beginning of being in time, but also towards the end of the first section of History of the Concept of Time, he's going to say, no, no. There's something to this idea of spirit. Like they're getting at something. Theologians who talk about this, they're getting at something. Right. Something's perceivable there, right? Like when someone dies, um, something perceivable has changed. And it's, and it's not just chemical processes. We can't just reduce that to that. Grandma's gone. It's not just, uh, you know, it's not just, oh, chemical processes changed, right? And so the, the, the question though is, okay, Who's the being that's asking the question? And what are the fundamental horizon of that being? The fundamental horizon of that being is not a bunch of other beings as entities, objects in the world to be understood. But it's also entities sh manifesting themselves in time, specifically in time. And so that's the one thing that combines the natural sciences and the human sciences is time. That is the horizon that unifies them both. They both operate in time, but capitalism has made it all too easy. Now, Heidegger doesn't use the word capitalism, but Heide capitalism has made it all too easy to see all of time in this calendar grid that is Cartesian in its essence, right? That is nihilistic in its essence, in the sense that it just, oh, well, it's just, you know, eventually we'll be swallowed up by the sun. Time is time. You know, it's just minutes and hours and, you know, weeks and years. And it's just on this infinite grid. And we're just arbitrary points in that. And it's like, you're taking some mathematical tools used to control nature and now you're using that to derive what your sense of meaning in the world it's just backwards it doesn't make any sense and so i guess that i'll start by saying my 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 three big reasons for being in time aside from the ones that i talked about in the last the last uh video where i talked about being in time it's basically his critique of modernity, scientism, and his influence on everyone who comes after. Um, but I think that the questions being asked are fundamental questions to being a thinker, period. And so, look, I mean, I've, I've got people who came on today who probably don't like being in time. Chris Katrunk doesn't, he says he was influenced by Heidegger. But the thing is, is like, it's going to force a kind of thinking on kinds of questions and issues you've just never really tarried with. And it's impossible to tarry with those in any way close to as deep through any other means. And that's why we're forced to have to read this is because you're not going to get it more pure. Like this is, this is a, it's notorious for a reason, but it's more importantly profound 
for a reason beyond its difficulty because there is always that mechanism of oh it's difficult and now i found clarity in it and now it makes sense to me and i have this pseudo profundity moment oh uh -huh, it's deep but really it was just putting something normal in complicated language and now you feel proud of having read something difficult that's the critique of all of continental philosophy it's true in a lot of cases there is that element of pleasure that comes after a lot of death drive jouissance trying to read a difficult text but no, there's something genuinely profound here going on, and it, it, it's the, it, it separates the boys from the men, separates the little kids from the adults, separates the little girls from the women, however we want to say it. It is a rite of passage into being able to have any kind of sense for where Derrida is coming from, for where Levinas is coming from, where Foucault is coming from, and I do believe Lacan. And so I think you're going to get a lot out of it, and I just like... I, first of all, you got me talking, so thank you. I, I want to hear you talk, though. Yeah, for sure. Oh, wow, I have so much to say. One, I want to just clarify that I don't think that phenomenology purely confines itself to the register of the imaginary. It begins with the imaginary, and I think that it begins with the imaginary in the sense that we're beginning with appearances, and I think why it would be a great supplement to... Lacan and the work of many Lacanians in general is that I feel like sometimes the imaginary is the, the register that's neglected, that kind of falls by the wayside over time. Uh, but Heidegger's point of departure is appearances, bracketing out things from appearance, right. and then from there we can actually focus on a kind of um, taxonomy of appearances that does get beyond appearances mm. and uh, to a, a kind of symbolic to the next in quotes the next register so uh, I think Lacan would probably criticize Heidegger for collapsing the two at points but even there, sure. there's even a, a productivity in, in in the collapsing there in the fact that Heidegger might not have the same conception of the real that Lacan has. But there are things in Heidegger that maybe Lacan and Zizek gloss over. Uh, although Zizek, he began as a Heideggerian, so he's more than conversant with the tradition. 100%. Something else I wanted to say, I'm kind of like bouncing all over the place, but here, uh, and I'm also just uh, giving you a preview of my three reasons. Um, you were talking about things in themselves, which is, of course, the concept that is most closely associated with Kant. And there are there's a fidelity there between phenomenology and Kant's project, the Kantian project. It's like Kant has his tables of judgment. He has his categories. He and, and his his domain is the transcendentally ideal transcendental idealism what transcends experience uh what goes into a cognition transcendentally to make that cognition possible and then it seems like well okay that's that's a worthy project that was absolutely copernican of course and it's um revolutionary potential but something something is neglected there. Something there's a remainder, you know. As a as a Zizekian, you know, us Zizekians, we love remainders. We love the miscellaneous. We love the things that that don't fit into the the scheme. And I feel like Heidegger is doing something similar. And it's like, okay, but what's being, you know? I feel like you were getting at this, Dave. You know what? What is getting um, a short shrift here in the history of philosophy itself, and at this point of the split between these two sciences, that you know what you were talking about with the kind of like spirit. Um, what religious people are often, you know, ridiculed for believing in, although they're they're pointing to something, even if they uh, tend to dogmatize it, is, and this is my understanding of design, which is like that which questions its own being, that which is able to ask questions about its being, of itself. 
And that's what philosophy is, right? And even the beginning of the history of philosophy from Socrates on, it's like we have something like philosophy before Socrates. We have pre-Socratics, proto-philosophers in a sense, but philosophy begins with kind of asking the question, right. what is philosophy? And that's a kind of design in itself, I think. So it's this this self-reflexiveness, this self-reflexivity that is is put under a microscope, that is scrutinized. And that I think that was probably what would make being in time so difficult because you have to keep that in mind. You're not talking about a substantial entity. We're not talking about a substantial subject. We're, and, and I think this is where he uh, probably objects to um, the Cartesian subject, right? It's like it too quickly becomes substantialized. It becomes turned into something concrete. You know, Lacan loves the, the, the cogito, the technique of it, but then as soon as it's like the, uh, what res cogitans is like reunited with the, um, what's it, the res extensia or whatever, like the, the extent, the extension in the world, it's like, right. all right, okay, so we, we got back to our safe haven of the starting point of just like a world that's as a, a certain, almost medieval, right? It's like God's at the top. He has all of his uh, individual subjects, and now we're back at the uh, something substantial thank the lord but it's like this is a this is a vastly different project any jumping off points there i've got a few i guess i want to say that you know i will be speaking strongly and uh, assertively from my hunches uh, uh, as far as interpretations of this text goes. But uh, part of the goal of that is to fumble into deadlocks and contradictions. And there are some fundamental um, disagreements in the field um, that we are diving into here, um, including like being itself, like in being in time, like it shouldn't even be called being in time. It should be called uh, meaning in time or sense of sense of being, meaning of being and time. Um, the, the reason being that Heidegger, th there's an, a, there is a world of rocks and stones and trees that if we die, it, it exists. But the thing is, is it won't exist for us. And the thing is, it, right now it does exist for us. There's no denying that it, it exists for us in a sense. Now, obviously not in like a linear causal, you know, phys physicist sense, but like, you know, it, it, it exists for us. And it, the thing is, is we've made it exist for us. He's critical of this in the sense that the age of inframing, the age of technology, it reduces the entire world into a standing reserve on call for us, right? Um, which would be great if we actually got to be the lords and possessors of the earth like Descartes thought it would make us. But actually what it does is it puts us on call as standing reserve to one another as well or to, the, to our bosses, right? Um, but also the Heideggerian critique of the Soviet Union is that this is, uh, this is capitalism led by the workers. You know, It's still capitalism, right? And so the the... The, you know, in, in either form of capitalism, the entire earth is still reduced to standing reserve on call for our desires, but we are also all still put on call for one another, which just means that we're all exploited. And it doesn't matter if we're exploited by overlord bosses who live in mansions or if we're exploited by some uh, professional revolutionaries who say that they're doing things in our interest. If, if the disposition, the fundamental disposition towards nature is the same, then the question is, is have we lost something fundamental to, to what can give a meaningful life, right? And so people go, well, that's nostalgia. Well, yeah, he's a conservative, you know. Um, but also there is, uh, I mean, capitalism is, as, Cap as Marx says, melting everything solid into air. Everything holy is profaned, right? And I mean, good riddance in a sense, but also... 
um, some of the things are things that are potentially worth um, maintaining, right? Not returning to, but maintaining, like relationships. Relationships are worth maintaining. Now, maybe not relationships with everybody you know. Maybe some people, you can cut them off, whatever. But the point is, is relationships themselves are worth maintaining. And we live in a society today that's lost its sense for ethics and etiquette and morality, all three, as well as politics, which is separate from those things. And so the, the sense of all of those terms has been lost, and all we have is a bunch of simulation of these things. And so, you know, just because those need to be maintained um, doesn't mean that we have to return to some specific mode of life. But it does mean that it would behoove us to, to try to think through what is being, what is being in the world, um, and what is meaning, what is the meaning of life, and to do so with an eye to the future and how we're going to live on this planet with one another, right? Anyone who wants to say it doesn't matter, that that doesn't matter, that, you know, a fundamental ontology that's going to try to actually get to the essence of the difference between rocks and trees and, you know, piles of trash on the side of the road and your actual grandma who has like maybe a couple of years left on this planet and is lonely right now, like that, there's fundamental distinctions between these kinds of beings. What, just because we don't believe in angels and God, we're going to throw out the differences between kinds of being and reduce it all into atoms? It's fucking insanity. And that's what a lot of this kind of, uh, what would I call it? Uh, just just a lot of the people who call themselves materialists, is what that's what they're doing. It's all atoms in the void. And they, oh, I'm a dialectical materialist. And so... It's atoms and then they're emergent and okay, cool, it's, they're emergent. But have you actually ever really thought, really thought about being? And so I do think it's a fundamental like worthwhile activity on its own. But as far as like blunders and mistakes or, or, or kinds of inter ways of interpreting the field, the one thing I wanted to touch on before I kind of turn it back over here. So Dasein, yeah, it's, a, it's the being that asks the questions, right? Instead of defining... Um, it's, a, it's a being whose being is an issue for it. That's why it asks questions, right? Well, what does that mean to say it's a being whose being is an issue for it? Like, obviously, dogs and cats have to worry about survival just as much as worms and horses. Like, trees have to worry about survival. Everything worries about survival. Everything perishes. Everything comes in and out of existence. But we're that one being who cares so much about... Uh, not passing out of existence willy-nilly in, in a way that goes beyond um, uh, mere survival and is actually so powerful that we might take our own lives, right? Like you don't have, no other creature has its being be an issue for it so strongly that it would take its own life before losing itself while still having to exist. Because there's a way that you can lose your, your honor or that you can lose uh, your meaning or that you can you can see a political system going against everything that matters to you and you take a stand and you say no I, I would rather die than be in that future and uh, that's not something that we get from other kinds of being so being is an issue for us and it's being unto death and not death in the way that we perceive right so phenomenology getting away from what is perceived perfect example we perceive death as perishing. That is not the existential phenomenological sense of the term death. And you're familiar with it, but for anyone who's tuning in, it's just like being unto death is being creatures who can die before they die, right? You can die at the age of 50 and still live out to be 90, right? You could, you could die at the age of 20 and still keep living through your 20s, right? More than this is the possibility of that kind of existential world collapse. The possibility of that existential world collapse is always there with us. It haunts us. And we don't like to sit with it. It's a kind of negation that we don't like to tarry with. And this is formative of everything, shapes everything. And 
you know, I just, I, I think that really thinking about its influence on us, um, not, not death as death, it, you know, leaving existence potentially, but specifically the possibility of no more possibility. And that includes like losing your master signifier or losing your profession or losing uh, your legs when you're, an you're an, uh, like an athlete, like losing something that made the whole world make sense and gave you a place in it. And then like that, yeah, that, that possibility is part of the reason that our being is an issue for us. But I say us because it's like Dasein's not a he, it's not a she, it's not a one individual human being. Heidegger brackets out the this 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 individual versus collective. He he brackets that out, and yeah, there is this sense of like the self vis-a-vis -vis the they. But the thing is, is he alternates his usage Dasein between a plural and an individual in a way that's actually meant to he's trying to break a habit of thinking of, well, there's groups of humans made up of individuals. And instead it's like, no, it's, this is more like for anyone with some familiarity in Hegel, what Hegel's talking about when he talks about spirit, right? We're talking about like, the, what's the point of departure for spirit? It's the being that asks the questions, but is the being that asks the question an individual like Descartes sitting in a cabin in the woods or is it people? living amongst one another, having a shared basis in the world, right? And so this is part of like uh, how, I mean, really his thought lays the basis for two of the most important sociological thinkers of the 20th century, still popular in academia today, Bourdieu and Foucault, right? It is the, it is specifically his treatment of Dasein and being in time that lays the basis for thinking about humans in a way that breaks out of this atomizing versus group kind of like differentiation thing. And so it's just, whenever we think of Dasein, we've got to remember it's meant to foil any substitute with words like group, individual, soul, spirit, subject, and a uh, rational animal or made in the image of God. It's meant to substitute all of, it's not, it's not meant to substitute all of those. It's meant to bracket out all of those and say, no, 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 no. You don't really have an experience as an individual. You have a whole life narrative as an individual that's been sold to you, that's a modern construct, but a lot of people throughout history haven't had this concept. And it's an, it is a concept. And it's a concept worth worth bracketing out and thinking about because it also makes sense of totalitarianism. It also makes sense of, uh, you know, when, 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 when human masses act in certain ways that are totally irrational uh, from the individual standpoint, right? Um, we're not, we're, it's pretty easy to lose our sense of individuality and, and be a part of something a lot bigger because in a sense we are, right? So, yeah, I just wanted to say that he brackets out individual versus collective and that there's po there's problems with that. It ushers in all kinds of problems that are worth thinking about. But but that, yeah, it's it's uh, for the next month, Just uh, I just want to really implore everybody to be thinking about that. Um, Alexander Dugan, supposedly the right-hand man of, you know, Vladimir Putin, uh, like the, the chief ideologist of the Russian conservative state, um, he likes... Heidegger and has a specific interpretation of Heidegger that says, no, Dasein's always collective and Dasein is a people bound by, bound by, um, blood and soil. Right. So it's pretty, if, if you read it that way, it's pretty easy to see, oh, okay, well, this is how, this is how that could work. That whole Nazi reading. Um, now someone like Mikey is going to fundamentally disagree with this. There's a ton of ways that, um, Dasein still like, still does get centered in individuals that have fundamental contradictions and breaks from any kind of an organic unity. And Heidegger doesn't talk about organic unities. Dugan talks about organic unities. Spangler talks about organic unities. Uh, Evola talks about organic unities. Heidegger's not talking about organic unities when he and 
you know, you can read it that way, but I think that it, 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 it hurts, it hurts things, but at the same time, it's worth thinking about all of it as we approach the text, because the, the main point is to be confused when we use the term Dasein. Yeah, what you just reminded me of there with uh, Dugan's take on Dasein, uh, I couldn't help but think of, um, I guess it's the first chapter of where they know not what they do, although he repeats this a few times, that the 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 apex of culture comes to resemble barbarism in a way in that it, in in the monarch for example we get the the quilting of an entire community that is simultaneously uprooted from uh kind of supposedly like reme immediate organic uh, connection with the 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 earth but also becomes a people in that very act becomes a, a an organic whole and i could see design in the wrong hand sort of like suggesting itself as that without there there being this gap this important hegelian kind of gap that needs to be you know the constitutive, the constitutive backdrop of of any whole is always its its contrary, its opposite, it's always contradictory, in a sense. I don't want to go too far afield of what we were talking about here, but that's just what came to mind. No, uh, it's not like, too. And it, you know, intersection between nature and culture, or lack thereof, and I think that's where it's like we get some. P potential for some um, misinterpretations, so, some, you know, dangerous, um, I, they wouldn't even be considered deviations necessarily from Heidegger's point of view, but it's in some ways that's just a testament to how how rich this this text is with with possibilities of interpretation. Yeah, and I would just add that, you know, in a sort of sense, this is the ultimate steel man of conservatism itself. And that it really needs to be read that way. If we are modern or consider ourselves modern, or if we consider ourselves liberal or progressive or leftist or any other kind of ism that is a product of this thing where we think we're enlightened and that all traditional peoples across the entire globe are just backwards. Um, okay, first of all, Let's just say maybe that's true, right? Maybe that's true. But also, you know, should we be critical of, of all traditional people everywhere on the basis of, you know, someone who doesn't read philosophy or if they do, it's just like Plato and Homer and like that's pretty much like their whole background, you know, that and their, you know, their, their Bible or whatever. Like should we be critical of that person and their attitudes and opinions, um, and use them as our punching bag, or should we, you know, uh, uh, by the way, this, the same thing, like they're, they're representative in the Republican party, right? Should we, sh is that a good person to make ourselves stronger by disagreeing with, but first trying to genuinely understand, or do we go to the most profound defense of something, uh, that, that maybe these other people are kind of feeling in their gut, but they're not able to really articulate because they're not as Im Im immersed in like the entire history of, of, of philosophy. Right. For me, I say, um, like, I don't, I don't want to fuck with like some, some second rate socialist from Jacobin. I'm going to go to Marx and I'm not going to fuck with some second rate, you know, what Ben Shapiro or some shit? Like I don't give a fuck. I'm going to Heidegger because I'm gonna take me to your leader, take me to your most profound thinker you've ever had, take me to the best of the best of the best, and shut the fuck up with the rest. Now, obviously, I don't stop with the rest. I I try to do, still go to the rest, but it really is Heidegger and and, and Marx for me as like my main two. And so, um, and not to synthesize them, but to 
they each have fundamental um, perspectives that are irreconcilable, irreconcilable. And by working through these contradictions, we're able to see things that lay the, 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 the basis, I hope, for an even better approach. And that's not one that would um, take them and go, combine them, red-brown alliance. No, 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 no. It's one that says, fuck the red, fuck the brown. What's something else? Right? I don't want to hang out with tankies and Nazis. I want to hang out with uh, people who are fundamentally disillusioned with what exists, but also don't take solutions, purported solutions from the 1920s as genuine solutions fit for our times, right? And uh, so, yeah, I, I think that there's like no better place for it. Like, honestly, like I'm profoundly critical of nationalisms, all nationalisms. I'm profoundly critical of black nationalism. I'm obviously profoundly critical of white nationalism. I mean, any nationalism. I've always thought that patriotism was silly. I've, I gr but, you know, that was my disposition. You know, besides a few times feeling my heart swell to the to the to the pretty music, um, the the general tendency was, this is like a cult, right? Like this is this is kind of weird that that people take this shit so seriously. And even at the university, like the the people with the the military people marching down at the, at, you know, at your actual graduation, it's like, why is the military here? Why is the police here? What's going on here? You know, Foucault's like peering in, and. The, my, my, my fundamental disposition against to, being told that I'm supposed to have some fidelity to some big collective group that is supposedly representing my interests, it, I've, been, oh, oh, I've been told it's, no, you're just anti-authoritarian. No, I don't think I am. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely anti, like, uh, just being told I just need to follow for following sake. I just want to understand like what's the plan. And I want people to actually tr give a give an honest shot at, at saying what the plan is. But with all that said, like Marvin Garvey or uh is that, is that his name? Uh the the black nationalist, the famous one. Or uh Elijah Muhammad or uh like Louis Farrakhan or uh, like all of these, these black nationalist guys, if you actually read them, and I'm, I'm forgetting if it's Elijah Muhammad or, or, or Garvey, but uh, I actually, I remember reading one of the, their things and I was like, this is kind of like Heidegger. It's like hard not to read it kind of like Heidegger because basically what he's saying um, is that there is, there are background conditions that render intelligible ways of living. And if you don't have those background conditions, you're not going to understand like someone else. And so it's like, you know, you can go to Saudi Arabia, you can live there, but I I'm living in Mexico, but am I really Mexican? No. Can I try to understand it? Yes. But like, what is it? Is it a totality? Is it like a singular organic totality? Or what, 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 what makes up a culture in a, in a way that can't be reduced or, or, or erased without literally like ruining people's lives, right? That if not needing to be preserved in a sort of sense might need to be left alone to some degree if anyone ever wants to make any genuine kind of world change. These are fundamental questions for me when it comes to social change theory, when it comes to a universalist project that wouldn't just erase difference. And I think that someone like Dugan is exploiting a, a lot of things um, and putting it together into an ideology to serve a state. But part of what he's exploiting is a genuine need for a sense of some kind of a cultural relativism, which he calls for. He calls for an anti-racist cultural relativism one that would allow Russians and United States and, you know, various other domains to kind of do their own thing. Um, but he's for basically a bunch of empires living on this planet together instead of a bunch of s smaller municipalities. He, he would not be down with 
smaller municipalities having their own basic control over their own lives, right? His, his idea of, of cultural diversity is giant nation states coexisting as opposed to, you know, no, Aguas Caliente, Mexico and Boise, Idaho and Philadelphia need to be able to come to their own decisions about how to live. And that is not uh, something that needs to be dictated by a central committee that is overseeing all changes happening on the planet. And if any social change theorists in the future think that that that, that kind of change is possible, being a time shows why it's impossible. It doesn't just make you sympathetic to people who feel like it's impossible. No, it shows you why it's actually impossible. Like uh, there's a there's a good field study that uh, from anthropology that does something that correlates really well with being in time. James Scott's seeing like a state is fantastic, and especially like the the last half of that text. Um, it's 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 basically like he's giving you some of the key insights from being in time, but without making any references to being in time, and he's just focusing on facts, 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 facts. But it's just like. Yeah, part of what we get to is how this undermines what James Scott calls high modernism, which is really just what Heidegger is going to call modernity or Cartesianism. I have a question for you. Yeah, what's up? Um, this, do you think that this Dugan-esque notion of a kind of collective design that can be, I don't know what we could call it, like further developed, um, reinforced, uh, you know, further pronounced as opposed to something we're just by default immersed in. In your opinion, does that show fidelity to Heidegger's text or is that a kind of deviation because in my experience it's like a lot of a lot of readers of philosophy tend to take texts as prescriptions you know right. design is not just a description of how one should be in the world but a prescription for how one should better be in the world right it's like I know I know I don't understand it myself because I haven't read deeply enough but Heidegger has his own notion of authenticity for example but if there is a prescription what is it or are we misreading by looking for a prescription i definitely don't think he's i, I think he's definitely trying to safeguard against prescribing um now, there is a, re a way of reading his entire life's project as pure anti-Marxism. Um, when I say that there's a way of reading that, uh, I don't think Lukács even would say such a thing in, uh, what is it, The Destruction of Reason, or whatever the fuck it's called. Um, I know Andrew's in the chat and will suggest it. Uh, he actually, he corrected me, it's Marcus Garvey. I think I said Marvin. <laughs> Um, but <laughs> Marvin, no. So like, obviously someone like Mar Marcus Garvey is prescribing, um, yeah. So he's, he's pretty adamant and clear during this period. And I can't say for his, I can't speak to his entire or or whatever, but I know that in his, in this period, he is, um, trying to be as scientific as possible and that his understanding of what science is a genuine science that has a real capability of getting outside of psychologizing philosophy, but actually kind of getting to the root of both philosophy and psychology, right? Um, requires a sort of scientific fidelity to 
trying to understand before prescribing and that he spent his life trying to understand before prescribing. Um, as far as his political affiliations and whether or not he was anti-Marxist or whatever, and I forget who said that, by the way. Um, there's an, It's escaping me right now. There's a book I was just reading um, that suggests that, and I'll have to, I'll have to, I think it's Bourdieu says that shit. Um, but, because Bourdieu's a big critic of, of Heidegger. Um, but, you know, he, he, he bought into lesser evil thinking, right? He bought into lesser evil thinking. Um, from, from his standpoint, uh, the, the, the Red Army was raping and pillaging his country, right? Like, is that right? Um, well, I was just in Poland and, uh, one of the people I was speaking to who's a leftist was like, yeah, my grandma would talk about how that was everybody's like, that's what they saw when the red army would come in, you know, to liberate. It, it was really just raping and pillaging. Right. So it's like lofty words, but what's the reality behind it? Right. Oh, they want to rule the world. Hell no. Right. And so, you know, this is. This lesser evil thinking is something that we'll critique through Emmanuel Levinas, right? And so part of the importance of being in time is that it lays the basis for totality and infinity. Um, and I, and I, I, I read that not only as a critique of most people's lesser evilist thinking, which is used to justify every horror that's ever existed, but um, also is a critique of both Heidegger and Marx and the Soviet Union and Germany. And, you know, he was a, you know, a French Jew in a German POW camp in World War II, Levinas was. Um, so, I mean, he fought Nazis. He spent time interned um, with, you know, under their, uh, you know, as a prisoner. And, uh, but, but before the war, he had studied under Heidegger, right? And Husserl. He was, uh, Levinas was the first person to interpret Husserl into French, right? So Sartre kind of owes a big debt to Levinas in that sense. Um, Levinas is a really strange thinker, um, and he's been totally bastardized by the sort of liberal left progressivist Judith Butlerian kind of uh, appropriation of his work uh, because they try to appropriate it into its own kind of lesser evilist approach to politics, right? When he's fundamentally opposed to that. But no, I do think that Heidegger during this period is probably, if we if we were going to psychoanalyze him or armchair psychologize the situation, I think he's actually probably, yeah, worried about um, what's happening in the world and how um, it's being rendered impossible just to have a life, right? Um, and he sees he sees all of these uh, these pushes uh, by surrounding countries as the responsible parties, right? Now, I um, I disagree profoundly, but I also understand why someone would think that. And so when people say, oh, well, we just have to read Heidegger for his philosophy and not his politics. He was just bad at politics, but good at philosophy. I, I don't think that's true. I think we're all bad at politics and we're all bad at philosophy. He was bad at politics and he was good at philosophy, but his politics does make a really important question mark over his entire the entirety of his philosophy. And it's something that I'm not settled on and that I'll be thinking about because I'm going to keep reading Lukács. I'll keep reading Bourdieu. I'll keep reading Levinas and all of these critics of Heidegger. And really, that's how I see him as the door key to so much of philosophy is people's selective silences throughout the entirety of their life's work as philosophers in the 20th century. As well, you know, as well as their their actual critiques of him. Um, usually, those critiques of him, it feels like a straw man. They're missing the entire point, and it seems like they got the main point, and they're just not giving credit where it's due. That's almost always the situation with the French. And so it's like, as a thinker for myself, the the main reason is not his critique of modernity, his his critique of scientism, and that he's a door key to everyone else. But more, mainly as a, as a thinker, like as a thinker, like as someone who desires to be a scholar and a thinker, like I do, I want to be one. Um, I think that 
critiquing ideology on those fronts, as well as reading other thinkers in the way that we just described, this is fundamental to being able to do this thing that we want to do, which is called thinking, right? And so, yeah, but as far as whether it's prescriptive or not, it, it really could be, but he supposedly bracketed that shit out. It's kind of like Foucault has bracketed out um, just rule, uh, ethics, morality, um, you know, differences between kinds of power. Uh, like he just wants to focus on power and bracket out all those other questions that political philosophers have tended to get focused on. And he's doing so as a Heideggerian his entire life, a crypto Heideggerian. Um, what does that mean? I don't even know yet. Like, what are the real implications of it? We'll never know unless we do this work. So, you know, that's why we're doing it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Just to um, shift gears a bit, I wanted to present my my third point. I haven't formally uh, presented one and two, but I covered those. But I came up with this kind of clunky, maybe, analogy of why Heidegger is important to me. And I think that when it comes to our time energy, um, yeah. who, which thinkers, you know, we can realistically dedicate time to, who we can carry with. We have to separate thinkers uh, into what I'm calling portals and sort of stopovers, right? It's like we stop over at certain thinkers. It's not that we don't respect them. Um, it's not that we don't value their thought or can't uh, sort of mine their text for concepts, but we just know in terms of the time we do have at our disposal that we're not going to spend too much time there. We might, let's say, hang out, get a cup of coffee, get acquainted, right, and then leave. Whereas Heidegger is, more, is a portal in that, well, I like what uh, Todd was saying earlier about, you know, true freedom being unconscious and feeling like we have to read a certain text, even if the thought itself fills us with dread is an important um, inclination to pursue rather than to try to get away from, oh, I only want to read what is fun and easily digestible because you're not going to be a scholar or a thinker or a philosopher unless you get to the other side of Heidegger, which is a a an ideal, an impossible ideal. I'm not saying there is another side where you'll actually get to the other side of the portal. Same with Lacan, same with Zizek, maybe some would say the same of Plato and Aristotle. I know it, it, this is somewhat subjective and plenty of people uh, just the, uh, when you presented the fact that you're going to be teaching this course, some people immediately took issue, got a little butt hurt, let's say. Uh, but this attitude, I think, of not having a choice in the matter, you must do this. You will fail. This is a, a portal. And the idea is to get to the other side. But you never will. That's how I feel uh, about Heidegger. And uh, who knows? Maybe I'll take this course and change my mind, but I doubt it. I think I'll just come out the other side more more baffled. Yeah, any 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 getting confused junkie is is gonna is gonna really like that. This is like the pure pure. This is like the this is the best. You're not gonna get it better. This is that good shit. Tight, tight, tight. Yeah. This is this is where it's at, right? Like, um. Besides all of that, like, yeah, I, I, man. I guess um, I'm spacing out now because it's been 12 hours and 37 minutes. 12 hours. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> I think we should probably wrap down pretty soon. I'm going to open it up to Q&A in a minute. 
Um, so what are your three reasons if you just say them? Send, you know, point, 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 point. Okay, I'll try to condense them. Number Portals. one is I think what Heidegger's doing uh, is a great supplement to the Kantian project. He's doing what Kant did for transcendental idealism, well, created transcendental idealism. He's doing that for imminence. Uh, two, for selfish reasons, because it's a, a essential supplement to Lacan. Zizek, all of those concepts to me, Heidegger right now is something of a, a vanishing mediator there. It's going to help me understand uh, the thinkers who I consider in my uh, wheelhouse better. And third, because Heidegger is not, not a layover, not a stopover, but a portal. I don't have a choice. You don't, you don't have it. You, you feel that way at this point. No, it sounds like I'm complaining, but I mean that in the best way possible, in the sense that that Todd was uh, laying out the you know freedom of the unconscious. I am I'm drawn to this book. I I dread it. It looms large. I don't have a choice in the sense that I can't call myself a thinker, or I don't call myself a philosopher, but even someone who dabbles in philosophy, unless I have a, a prolonged engagement with this text. And I'm, I'm very excited to be reading it. And I'm excited to have you, uh, Dave, shepherding me and everyone else in the course through this. Up until this point, you know, um, the Lord, Mikey, has been my shepherd. <laughs> but you're going to help us. You're going to shepherd us. And I am looking forward to playing the Dave to your Mikey, in a sense. Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. yeah. No, I, I, it was Mikey's idea. We should give credit where it goes. I mean, actually, like, he's he's made some, like, shout outs for this course and, you know, he's given it his full support and everything like that. But he's never just, like, written something about, like, no, he actually sent me a bunch of voice messages saying, look, I don't know what your overall plan is, like when you're actually planning on doing a solo lecture thing where you actually teach a course on your own without like co-instructors, but you need to do it within the first year. And I think you need to do being in time more than anything else. And that's good. I'm glad he was advocating for that because my goal was already being in time has to come before Das Kapital. Also, totality and infinity has to come before Das Kapital. Look, we're going to get a big influx of Marxists, worldview Marxists, when the Catron course happens. And they will be welcome with arms wide open, said just like Scott Stapp from Creed, you know, with arms wide open. But the thing is, I don't want too many of them. I don't want too many of them. I don't want this place to be like 50 of them and like three of us who are like, but also totality and infinity matters. You know, no, it's by the time they get here, they're going to be aware that all theory that is non-Marxist is not just petty bourgeois idealism, that it actually is a fundamental critique of their worldview and that any radical change theory that is ever going to have a hope of having any positive impact on any future that gets us out of anything they don't like in this day and age, it's going to come from genuine tarrying with those contradictions and working through them. And uh, that's what Marx would do. Hate to break it to them, but it's what he would have done. If he was resurrected today, he wouldn't say, all right, just give me Lenin and Stalin and Mao and Castro and Che and I'll Rosa and Kotsky and I'll just read them all and then I will build a new system out of that. No, he fucking wouldn't. That's so stupid. No, he would yeah, say... He uh, would, I was just going to say his dissertation was on like Epicurus, right? And like the atomists. So just goes to show you like nothing especially politically radical about that. And he gave it as much energy and thought as anything else. Sorry. Yes. Well, and you know, uh, you know, uh, for Lenin, you know, it, he, he's, he says, you know, Marx is really just like, he's the combination of taking the insights of, uh, French socialism, 
um, British political economy and German idealism and synthesizing those, right? I mean, and honestly, I need to I need a refresher on when he says this, but I'm pretty sure he doesn't say like it's an imminent critique of all of them using them against each other. I, maybe he does say that, and I need to just revisit it. But um, the point is, is uh, you know, a socialist who goes, oh, I just I want world change, I want positive change. Therefore, I'm just going to read the thinker who said that we need to stop interpreting the world and change it. And I'm pretty much just going to read, not even read his main theoretical works, but I'll read the politicians who use his name. That, I'm sorry, that would that approach would not get you um, this this rich, you know, this richness that comes from spending 20 years in the British Museum. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but, you know, spending that, spending all that time, 10 hours a day, pouring over these manuscripts from these different traditions. And these aren't traditions that were unified wholes. He had to understand the arguments within these, you know, movements of thought. And, you know, there's more movements of thought in our day and age. And in fact, there's like a complete overwhelming totality. Uh, I mean, it's not a totality, but an aggregate of a mass of of data and of information and we don't have ways of parsing it right and so the point of theory in uh, and philosophy in part is to help us parse it and um this is why on the last page of chapter one of being in time um uh, he says let's see do i have it here I hope so. I hope that this is it. No, fuck. Is this it? My uh, my Adobe Acrobat's like crapping out on me, and I think this is a sign that uh, the computer is like overheating from all of this streaming. But I'm on the wrong chapter. Here we go. So on um, page 77 of the Macri and Robinson, um, he says, we shall not, this is the second to last paragraph, right? Um, we shall not get a genuine knowledge of essences simply by the syncretistic activity of universal comparison and classification, right? So he's basically saying like, there's a fucking shit ton of information out there and we could just kind of piece it all together, like big old bricolage and compare things to, and then kind of classify things and then we'll know what being is. Or we'll know we'll have a sense for what being is. We'll have a sense for who we are. We'll have a sense for what our possibilities are. No. No. Then he says, subjecting the manifold to tabulation, which means subjecting everything to putting numbers on things and counting it all. Subjecting the manifold to tabulation does not ensure any actual understanding of what lies there before us as thus set in order. It goes on and it's like one of my favorite quotes from the beginning, but the basic point is just like, yeah, we, we, we need in the same way that like we have this desire to learn everything and to just accumulate knowledge, accumulate knowledge, and that that would make us, you know, knowledgeable or whatever. The, the goal of a, te a text like this is in a sort of sense to put all of that that we've accumulated throughout our lives into an acid bath and see what remains afterwards, right? It's not, it's not just so that we can accumulate a world of, so that we can tabulate the manifold, so that we can collect the wiki pages and, uh, and, and reference them at dinner parties, right? So, yeah, actually, I was hoping that I would actually get a chance to read something from this book um, in this conversation. But um, so what's our plan, man? We're going to come back here in the next, uh, we're going to have another conversation in the next couple of weeks, hopefully, to talk about like the first section of History of the Concept of Time. Is that right? Love that. Yeah, I'm actually um, reading a little bit of uh, Who's Real. Seems like important preliminary. Got uh, Becker's videos to guide me along there. Uh, he did a series on Cartesian meditations. And uh, uh, yeah, then I'm going to uh, jump into history of the concept of time. I'm pretty stoked.
Well, the first part is nine pages. Okay. And the and then chapter one, it's uh it's like thirteen pages. So basically, you know, this isn't like the fifty page chapters we might sometimes be dealing with in being in time. I think we deal with giant chapters like three times in the first division. But um yeah, I think that this is gonna be pretty pretty doable so like you know like if you sit down in a, in a in a place where you're devoted to reading for two hours you'd probably get through all of that and so if you can do that sometime in the next couple of weeks um i don't know maybe yeah maybe the beginning of may we should be looking to the beginning of may sometime but um we're gonna have to and it really, like, you don't have to, you don't have to, like, master this shit. You just, it's your first pass and then coming with some questions about it and stuff. Um, I really loved Andrew, Master Signified Bodies. He was doing, um, he's been hitting this text, right? And so I'm thinking uh, we'll probably all have to have a conversation, him with us. And uh, Speaking of, I'm wondering, uh, is he going to come on for the Q&A portion here? And is there anybody else in the chat who's going to come on for the Q&A portion here? Uh, it looks like a couple of people are in the background. And so I'm looking forward to kind of taking questions here before we close out. Is there anything you want to say before we pivot into kind of this Q&A, engage with the audience portion of this? How are you still alive right now? Dude, guess what? Hours. No caffeine, no THC. Um, this is like, uh, the first time I've ever done a long stream without either. So, yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. You're falling asleep over there yourself. I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to feel like energized after this and need to wind down. Like that's my problem is winding down like the hardest. See, it's easier to do a giant live stream than to do a bunch of live streams throughout the week because each one puts me into a different headspace and it's a different kind of energy than the kinds of energy that I need to do other kinds of things. And so in a weird way, like this is actually, it's hard, but it's, it's kind of easier than a lot of the shit that I tend to do. Pure Jewish science. Uh, I in think need so. Of right now. Dude, tomorrow's going to be dope. It's going to be awesome. Uh, is there anybody in the chat who's been here all day? Is there anybody who's been here most of the day? Has anybody only been here for this conversation? Has anybody only been here for the last few conversations? How about everybody in the chat say which conversations you caught? Um, don't bother mentioning the ones you just popped in on for a second. You know, just. But I'm curious, like, who caught what from today? Today's been wild. I mean, I did not plan on on some of the things that took place. And I mean, I, I'm just like pretty stoked how it all worked out. Did you catch any of it? Like you, you, you popped in for Todd, didn't you? I popped in for Todd. Um, God, I don't remember her name. The woman who was talking about identity politics. I saw some of that. Christine Louis de Soli. And uh, I saw Anne's first solo live stream, which was great. That's what I was able to make today. That's excellent. Yeah, I'm 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 really stoked that she did that. Um, and that she she, God, it's really cool because like she, she's a natural, right? She really is. Um, and it's just like, it's with theory plebe. It was kind of like that's my thing. With theory underground, like it's a lot more obvious that this is a, a thing where I'm trying to take the conversations that I already have with people and bring them into the light of day and formalize them enough that other people are able to be a part of the conversation. And so like that's what we're doing right now. That's what I've been doing with everybody on this. Well, there's a couple of people who were I, I never talked to Nina Power on a stream before. I never talked to Daniel Tut on a stream before. But everybody else, it's like, these are the conversations I have offline, right? We, but we step up our game a little bit because we're doing this, trying to bring other people in on it. So we're not just telling, our, telling each other, oh, we know what we're talking about. Oh, yeah. No, it's more like, 
do we? And shit, I got to talk, communicate with others. So it's cool. And the fact is, is like, Anne's one of my favorite, like people to have conversations with, like deep ass conversations. And so the fact that she was able to do her first solo stream today, like that was completely unplanned. And it was one of the coolest things that, that happened today for sure. Yeah. Props and great job. Um, the whole day, I mean, from what I've caught, uh, has been absolutely electrifying and you're right. It's like when you are caught in the gaze of the other, it, yeah, it's like doing it on, on hard mode. If it's just sending voice notes back and forth as we do, and that's great. Um, I mean, first, first of all, you can you can delete those. You can do take twos, take threes when the pressure's on. And that's when you really, though, also just cu- come up with some some shit. And I mean that as some shit like that's some shit or some shit. Like either way, it's like, yeah, either you, way. you know, it's like you, you got to go. That That's when uh, the some of the, the most interesting ideas emerge it's like when you're going out on a limb and i really i believe that and philosophy is just it can be so isolating and it is for so many people and what you're doing right now is trying to prevent people from becoming isolated and siloed and it's like i mean we talk we've talked about this ad nauseum but right now we both have had our experiences with academia um just that that whole shit show and uh it it disillusions a lot of people and then they think okay well maybe activism's the way to go but you can be just as equally disillusioned with the state of activism leftist activism at least in america right now so it's like where where to turn mhm hope mm-hmm. this is the place mhm i've yeah, man. Thank you. Thank you for being being here. Thanks for doing this. Um, so let's pivot into the Q and A portion. Uh, I'm gonna start by saying, Andrew, I hope you're able to pop in here. I said in the chat, get in here. Um, I hope you're able to. Um, and uh, Nance and everyone else, you're able to uncloak yourselves, like you know, pop in, dis- disclose thyself in in this chat. Like, actually, shit, it's like one one person left. So what? Who's who's here? It's just Nance now. Um, welcome, Nance. I'm gonna read something before before we kind of talk a bit more, and it's a it's a question from when I did this stream on like two weeks ago. Why being in time? This one was not so much why being in time, and it was more I should really retitle it why not being in time. Why you should not read this text uh, because I was mainly trying to discourage people from signing up for this course if they're not going to take it seriously. Um, and, and, uh, but there's a really great, uh, comment here that I want to read. Uh, it's a question. So it's part of the Q and a, because it is a question. Why, why? Oh my God. I wasn't supposed to say the name. Well, it doesn't matter. It's kind of anonymous anyway. I'm currently learning two languages, but this opportunity is something I'm interested in. I study very different eras and traditions, but I've been compelled to read being in time for a decade now. I'm already dealing with enough difficult texts, but I know what you mean about reading being in time, raising your acumen. I'm strongly considering this class. I would say though, if you did a course on Kant's critique of pure reason, I'd sign up even faster since he's more foundational and less controversial. I'm sure I wouldn't be the only one. Something to consider in the future. Now, I'm going to run to the restroom really quick, and I will be able to hear what goes on from my earbud here. So I'm just wondering, oh, Matan said goodbye. He said, got to go. It was a pleasure listening to all these talks. Well, it was great to have you, Matan. Take care. I hadn't seen in the chat until just now. But I'm actually going to uh, share this comment into the chat here so that... um, Nance, you've got a good reader voice. And Nick, you do too, but I, but Nance hasn't talked in a while. So Nance, if you would read my response, um, that'd be dope because that way I don't have to fucking read my own shit, which I really don't want to do right now. If, if Would you be willing to? 
Right. <clears throat> and then once you've done that, um, maybe Nick will read the other response. But yeah, I'll, I'll step away. Thanks. There are two ways of interpreting the second part of your comment. Either you are proposing that CPR is higher on your agenda for other unstated reasons, and in addition to that, maybe more other people would sign up to do its controversial nature to due to its controversial nature, or you are saying the only real reason it takes higher priority for you is because it is less controversial but just as essential. Both are valid, but I wrote a long response supposing that you meant the latter. If you meant the former, my response will still answer why being in time before CPR. Because your question is so good, I'm going to publish my response here on Theory Underground as well. Let me know if you want your username kept anonymous. Hello, I appreciate this comment very much. Kant's critique of pure reason is indeed more foundational in the chronological order of the tradition and is essential to everything. Oh no. Get an echo there. Echo. Uh, hello, I appreciate this comment very much. Kant's critique of pure reason is indeed more foundational in the chronological order of the tradition and is essential to everything else deemed essential at Theory Underground. If you look at the front page of theoryunderground.com, you will see, lower down, a sliding set of book cover images under the header Essential Texts. These have been there since day one of the site because there are certain texts I need to reread and re-reread with others over the next five years. The list is not comprehensive or complete and is lacking several other texts I consider equally essential, though less pressing in terms of time. Unlike some texts, Kant's CPR is shown on that list, so I have no doubt that it is coming. However, that is a year or two out, because I am not doing things chronologically. The order is not entirely arbitrary, because this is the first year of operations at Theory Underground. A lot of thought goes into the order of the courses. Of the essential texts, being in time precedes totality and infinity, which is followed by Das Kapital. Those are all prior to Kant's, CPR, Hegel's, POS, etc. What happens if I lead with Das Kapital? If I lead with Das Kapital, then I would attract a bunch of Marxists who don't care about philosophy. I have nothing against someone for whom Marx is an essential thinker. He is for me too. But someone who thinks Marx made other philosophers irrelevant? I can only handle such people in small doses. It's fine to have one or two of them around, but I would not want to have them oversaturate and dominate the spaces I'm constructing on the website. If we have a couple of token, dogmatic, traditional Marxists who are involved, then this will be good for everyone because such people, by holding fast to their line, are better able to help us see things, learn, and figure out our own positions in reference to their own. Yet they will be highly encouraged to tackle being in time and totality and infinity with me first, since I consider this necessary for having more substantial conversations about theories of self, world, and social change. What happens if I lead with Kant's critique of pure reason? If I, on the other hand, lead with Kant's CPR, then I get a bunch of philosophy students who like, who like to stay in a safe lane. Pure reason might have its limits, but philosophy should not. Kant is equally difficult, more dry and profound, but Kant is safe in a way because his politics are basically liberal. This should not matter because it does not change his relevance to historical attempts at pure thinking. But because academia is so competitive, with so much self-censorship, it becomes a serious factor for people. At Theory Underground, we try to first truly read such thinkers on their own terms as doing pure philosophy before critiquing their historical situatedness and how background bias may have factored into corrupt the purity of their thought. This latter reading is also essential, but it is the one people jump to, skipping the real reading, period. I just wrote a piece that defines these terms while presenting the three principles of study as a way of life. Being in time is indeed more controversial than CPR, but it separates those who are serious about philosophy first and foremost from those who care more about what a given book signals about them. To your credit, you are not unwilling to read Being in Time, though for sensible reasons, if I have correctly interpreted your comment, you still bulk at it enough to prioritize other texts first. This is both fair and sensible. Some people balk at the prospect of reading this text and then never go beyond that point, even rationalizing their hesitancy with the obvious kinds of reasons that might come to mind. 
I can respect that for people who have career-based images to maintain, but Theory Undergrounds or my image or my image aims to prioritize great texts, thinkers, and profound concepts over and above and before the other incentives and tendencies of philosophy and theory education related spaces. By prioritizing being in time, I filter out certain students with no ill will, but also without apologies. I hope you will join in this course, but if not, we will for sure be tackling CPR within a year or two. Nick, can you uh, read the response here? Um, I'm having a great time standing on the terrace looking outside. It, I realized like staring at a screen is not natural. Like our eyes are not used to the one point. And so I'm just looking off at this post sunset right now and it's just so great. And uh, so anyway, I, oh, and then I'll also share the other comment. Nancy, you can read that one. It's a short one. But um, yeah, so the, the main response, uh, if Nick, you can read that and then Nancy, you can read the other part. I just, I think this exchange is, okay. But yeah, all right, thank you. Yep. Uh, thank you for the detailed response. Now that I know you have a certain plan in place and you have a non-academic goal and methodology when it comes to the texts you study, I understand and deeply respect the order you are approaching philosophy. I am not in academia and I do not study the canonical Western thinkers. I'm not really coming from either of those two interpretations you put forward. But your comment made me really interrogate my thinking about the two texts. Coming from a Sufi Muslim background, being in time resonates more with who I am than CPR. Being in time makes a lot of sense as a Sufi. My interest in Kant comes from my study of Islamic philosophy. There is a line of thinkers who anticipate Kant in rejecting elements of Abyssinian peripateticism. That said, when I think about it, there is a reason I've spent the last 10 years trying to find a way to read Heidegger. I think I would benefit from being and time on a personal level. We are, all, we are all coming to philosophy from different perspectives. I don't balk at being in time at all. While being a not C <laughs> is plenty controversial for Heidegger, Kant wasn't free from related issues either. People focus on how problematic Heidegger is, but Kant is also pretty problematic, at least as a non-Westerner. Kant and the Neo-Kantians did much to close the Western mind off from non-Western streams of philosophy, you can read more about this in Van Norden's Taking Back Philosophy. His xenophobia did have a very real effect on how Western philosophy became more closed off right as colonialism was picking up steam. Not a great combination. That's getting too lost in the sauce. And it's a conversation to be had outside of a YouTube comment. Now that we've discussed the issue with controversy, let's talk chronology and importance. Chronologically, CPR comes first. If I'm taking the comic book approach to philosophy, I'd have to start there. That's just one approach, and by no means should it be the only one. Hello, Marxists. Canonicity and importance are also another way to approach philosophy. But not all philosophizing has to follow canon. Again, hello, Marxists. I would be a hypocrite as a student of non-Western philosophy if I took a fundamentalist approach to the Western canon. I appreciate your approach to looking at Heidegger and Kant as pure thinkers first, and it is an approach I try to follow in my own work. Thank you for getting me to think more deeply about my comment. While I'm probably not the type of seeker you expected, I'm not one of those philosophy students you are afraid of attracting. I'm not in it for safety, although I appreciate the ones who are. 
I feel like it's time for getting lost in being in time. I want to take your course, and I hope you continue to the other texts you mentioned, like Das Kapital. Hopefully, I'll be along for the ride. As for my comment, thank you for offering to keep it anonymous. I'll take you up on that author. Offer. Uh, that was a slip. Uh, what a beautiful... This is from Deckthon 11 days ago. Was I supposed to say that? Nance, I don't know. Nance will read, read Deathcon. Oh. <laughs> Did not realize that. What a beautiful exchange that was. That was the kind of discourse that the nerds who invented the internet probably assumed would become standard as it gained popularity as a communication medium if only (laughs) (laughs) dude if my comment section was always like this i would i wouldn't have started theory underground because like the, the ultimate goal is that the forums will slowly become a bit more like that It'll be a while until people have kind of acclimated and we've done some, people will have to go through a few courses before they kind of treat it that way. And we'll, we'll need the app, right? Like once the app is there. Um, but yeah, no, that's the kind of level of, con- like that's what I want, man. Like that's, that, that really made my day. So that's why I wanted to highlight it here at the beginning of the Q and A. But with that said, um, Nance, you've had your eye on chat. You've been here all fucking day. You just heard our whole conversation about being in time. I'm just, you signed up for being in time, right? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So even if it's just the three of us, we're gonna have a good time. But it uh, looks like we've got a couple other people involved already. And so um, Nance, what, what, what's your takeaways? Uh, I guess before we talk about the whole day, we should probably talk about this this one right here. So this segment, um, anything you're thinking about in particular? I, I'm interested to, um, observe the unfolding of the phenomenology of the imaginary and, and the, the interplay of, of that. Um, I'm new to Lacan and it's, kind of retroactively changing a lot of stuff that I thought I had a firm grasp on. Um, So I'm very much looking forward to that. I super appreciate Nick and Andrew, uh, their, their seminar readings on their YouTube Uh, going through that is, is awesome. So yeah, I'm looking forward to just looking at this in a new light and actually probably looking at it deeply for the first time ever. For the first time ever. I, I want to say that Nick and Andrew, their channel, initially, I was like, oh, no, they're trying to become influencers. You haven't been. And I really appreciate that, guys. Like, um, oh, Andrew's trying to get in here, but he doesn't have the link. The link is not in my email. Oh, my God. Hold on. I want to. I don't want to talk about the why I'm proud of you guys until I get him in here. So... Let's just send him this link directly, and then if I – hold on. I don't want to tell him it is in the email because what if it's not? But if it's not, then how did everybody else get in here? I got the – It's there. Maybe he didn't get added to the right email. That's, that is possible. I think, I think he's looking at the wrong email. The three, ma- three emails went out. One was for the, there we go. Here we go. Andrew Flores, Master Signified Bodies, the big Signorelli, in the house. Welcome to the stream. Audio probably still connecting, but where are you? Andrew? Hey! Yes. Yo, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. What's up? What's up? Dude, I didn't know you were locked out. Yeah, I, I was like blowing up the, the chat and then I, I sent the message in the messenger. I was like, yo, I don't got the link. Oh, you were even blowing up the chat? Fuck. Yeah. I had no idea. 
Well, man, <laughs> I, I was just about to talk about why I'm proud of you guys. Um, and then I was like, where the fuck is Andrew? <laughs> so that's why I went looking. Um, you, you probably got multiple emails and you were probably looking at the one that I sent out to everybody. Um, yeah, I even tried to look back. I didn't see like any of the, the later ones. The other notifications I got from Theory Underground are from like uh, the WordPress and like um, discussion boards, like comments. So the one you were looking at is the first email you may ever read from me, Theory Underground yeah. launch? Okay. So, yeah, there's definitely not a link in that one. But you should have gotten the one that's called interview confirmation and info, Zoom link, etc. So I'm going to no, forward that. No, I didn't that, get that. I'm going to forward that, that to you. So tomorrow, we're kind of like you, you and me. We're headlining this shit tomorrow. Yeah. And so I'm going to send you this right now. Because, yeah. It, and basically, your the email is the, the one that starts with Flores, right? Ends in mm-hmm. Gmail. Okay. Uh, a M or no no it should be A M Flores J R nine six. Is Wait. that the one you got? A M Flores. Yeah. I had Flores J Andrew. Oh okay. Well, I mean, I don't have that one hooked up to my computer. That's probably why I didn't I didn't get that one. All right. Well, just send me your email. We'll get it figured out. Yeah. Because uh, I don't think your other email is even on my other list, but. Uh, okay, so what I was just about to say, though, is that – so what we've been talking about is how, how stoked we are to do this shit or whatever, right? And so – Yeah. But I was just going to say, like, when you guys started your channel, I was worried that you're going to go this influencer route. And I've been really proud of you guys for kind of resisting the algorithmic incentives to just do topical shit. Like, you've really honed in on doing the kinds of content that forces you to do – a lot of difficult prep work and then talk about things that will alienate most people who are just looking for something sensational. Right. So, so good on you guys. And uh, in that sense, you're basically early to the Theory Underground game of fellow travelers who've started doing exegetical readings and started doing these te- more textual-based conversations. You guys have been you you were you were doing it before any of anyone else was doing it, and so in that sense, you really are the vanishing mediators. Appreciate that. Tight, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's tight. Um. So anyway, Andrew, Nick, Nance, any uh any questions, thoughts, anything you want to say about the 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 stream in general? Uh, specifically from this segment or or whatever before we kind of start wrapping it down. No, I think I said it all. We got a lot of reading to do. So yeah. I'm back with uh, more ammunition when we take on the uh, beginning of uh, history of the concept of time. Mm-hmm. Hell yeah, Andrew. How about you? Um, well, I think one thing I, uh, I would like to kind of clarify is like within the relationship between history of the concept of time and being in time, um, what, how, how is uh, Brentano, because when he mentions Brentano's uh, kind of investigation into psychology and um, I think it's chapter one. Um, how how in what way is Brentano's like method like sort of proto phenomenology? Because he's investigating psychology first, right? Right. Yeah, and yeah. you know, phenomenology comes out of sort of a critique of psychologism and naturalism, right. both, right? And mm-hmm. so. Um, because he doesn't, Brentano doesn't use the term things in themselves, but he uses something like we should let the things present themselves or something like that. Yeah, it's close. Yeah, it's close. Yeah. But the basic, the basic point is that that was the scientific ethos of the day. So they, they wanted to break with scientism, which is thinking that any given field can answer all of the other, all the questions of, you know, all the fundamental questions of humanity, right? Like, no, 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 no single instrumentalized field is going to be able to do that. 
um, and, and just thinking that, oh, the scientific approach is the approach and it's the end all. But at the same time, they, they, they really appreciate in the same sense that Hegel did that idea of, of, uh, the ideal of having your, your concepts right. not be projected onto the, whatever the subject matter is, but developed out of it. Right from 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 trying to get outside of ideology and word games, to try to understand like what's actually going on there, yeah. So so as far as like the relation between Brentano, Husserl, like we we can go off of what Heidegger says in the history of the concept of time, which for now is good enough, right? Mm -hmm. It's proto it's proto Husserlian in the sense that. Yeah, it's a, it's aware that intentionality is a thing, and it wants to get it basically wants to get to the things themselves, right? But right. then it's 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 Husserl who formalizes that, and uh, and and makes it kind of his life project. But he doesn't just do that in general. He's mainly interested in the relationship between consciousness and numbers and logic, yeah. and yeah. and is is math founded on logic? Is logic founded on math? Um, why does the world seem mathematical? Is that because we're inside of a computer simulation or is it because God is a mathematician or is it because human consciousness itself has structures to it and those structures to consciousness are going to right. disclose reality in certain ways? Right. And that would be Husserl's position. Is that it's called intuitivism versus formalism, right? Formalism says right. no math is based off of fundamental axioms. Whereas this intuitive approach, it has nothing to do with the word intuitive intuition in, in American Standard English. So right. don't disassociate. But yeah. the, yeah, the in, intuitivism for for the people influenced by Husserl is to say no math and logic. These are founded on existential structures of the the subject's conscious experience and relation to the world itself. That doesn't mean yeah. that the world is all inside of our heads, but it does mean right. we perceive the world and that that's fundamentally perceived through a, 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 almost a, kind of like how Quant would talk about, right? Right, like we have that would be a psychologism structures. by bringing it just all inside our heads, right? And then we right. get stuck in deadlocks of solipsism and mind-body dualism type thing. Um, yeah. One thing I found interesting about that, and I wonder if you would agree if like, if there's any criticisms of Kant from Heidegger, it's because what he points out in the concept of time or history of the concept of time about like the sort of schism of neo-Kantianism. I forget the other school, but there's the, I think the main proponent is the Marburg school, which focuses on uh, the scientific appropriation of Kant rather than like the conditions of possibility for uh, experience and knowledge. It's like, of scientific experience and scientific knowledge. So it's like already right there, they've used like, they've kind of regressed to uh, a philosophy of science that relies on uh, Kant and maybe even pre-Kantianism, but they fall into like the sort of tradition to where like they end up going back to like, oh, subject object dualism, but in the framework of like em empirical and observational facts, right? Cause like they're gonna say like, we're all about the facts, but like, the facts can only be grounded within a framework that talks about scientific experience as a condition of possibilities. Like, and they kind of like bracket out everything else. Like is, is Heidegger kind of critical of that sort of Kant and not like Kant how we would understand Kant now that we kind of know the difference like from the history of ideas? I think I failed to fully follow your question and that's either a function of or the result direct product of this being a 13 hour and 21 minute stream or it's because it was perhaps the way you put it and I just am curious if Nance or so Nate, the, you, let me just shorten it is when no, we look is, at like any kind of criticisms of Kant uh, by Heidegger is it Kant himself or is it Marburg appropriation of Kant of philosophy of science and using Kant to talk about conditions of possibility of scientific experience and scientific knowledge rather than philosophical knowledge and epistemology. Oh. Yeah. 
because yeah, he points that, that out is, in the history that is of what he talks about. That, that is what he talks yeah. about in history. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, sorry, I missed the word Marburg when you were originally talking. Yeah, because so, yeah. because there's two schools, but Marburg is like the primary one. I know Lukacs is also critical of that school as well. Right, and so. Yeah, the sort of philosophy can only be the handmaiden of the sciences after Kant being respon you know, Marburg being responsible for that. Um, yeah, I and, and then and then philosophy being sort of nothing but philosophy of science in the nineteenth yeah. century. At the very point when when every one of the sciences was under crisis, realizing that it, its its foundations were falling out from under itself, right? Right. General right. relativity theory, quantum mechanics, and uh, he goes into math examples. He goes into all these other fields of examples of various ways that the foundations of these sciences were failing uh, or falling out from under the sciences. Yet, nonetheless, philosoph philosophers of science were trying to stay in those wheelhouses like Oh, okay, well, working within this system, all we need to do is reclassify things. If right. If we just reclassify things, we can put it all right back together. Maybe we're missing a category. Maybe we're missing a faculty. We just need to find, an, uh, uh, like Nietzsche said, after Kant, everybody's so excited yeah. to discover a new faculty, right? Right. Yeah, it was like even the theologians were going through their Bibles looking for a synthetic a priori. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, that's a solid question, and uh, it, you, you almost lost me there, but no, that, thank you for clarifying it. Right. Um, with all of that said, uh, I think that we are about to close out, uh, and before we close out, I want to just kind of turn it to a general sort of reflection on the entire day, and uh, I want to give everybody a moment here to say their whatever they want about the the stream marathon itself day one here it is in conclusion um and i will just say it's i knew it was going to be fun but i had no idea i really had no idea what was going to transpire and how it was all going to go and how in a sort of eerie sense it all fits together like this grand totality like it really does like the common threads and the various guests and it all just weaves together in this sort of way. Not a lot of people are going to have the stamina, endurance, uh, or time and energy to be able to do the whole thing. But I know for a fact, at least two people in the world are going to listen to the whole thing and then re-listen to it within the next six months. And they're probably going to do it at work and they'll be homies. <laughs> they're going to be fellow travelers on a level that people who kind of pick a video here and a video there and a, you know that we do that they, they don't they're not going to have that basis and so i you know whoever whoever's doing that shout out to you we're doing it for you we're trying to provide people a way of kind of getting it all the whole kind of what is the approach the mindset the attitude the essential questions, the concepts, the thinkers of theory underground. What is all of the intent that has gone into it? Like, what is the bigger picture? Like, if you haven't done this stream today, you probably don't fucking know. And so, yeah. hell yeah. That's my thoughts. Anything else you guys have to say? I popped in and out, so I don't. I haven't really seen like everything, you know. I popped in and out of like the Tut one a little, and then like I caught the ending of the McGowan. I missed the Catron one. Did you get the Ann one? I did. Yeah, I did get. Yeah, about uh, critical media and yeah. uh, ten ways to break up with your phone, your iPhone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. that was a good one. Hell yeah. Um. No, it's just really cool because I linked up with all of y'all. Like, it's uh, it's coming on a year now, so yeah, this is just surreal and fun and exciting, uh, and it hasn't even been a year, and here we are, and there have been so many developments. Mm. It, of time i mean we've like collectively created so much content brought so many other fellow travelers along and uh 
you know, this is just the beginning. So I really can't uh, even begin to imagine how it's going to uh, snowball from here. This is just so sick. And yeah, I just want to thank uh, everybody for supporting me and Andrew, um, for including us. Uh, and and Dave, you're the you're the one with the vision, and uh, you're pulling it off. No, I've I've just been trying to have specific spaces or kinds of conversations for longer, uh, and most people who study philosophy don't feel the need to piggyback off others and do things in this like I did like other people get sick of philosophy club and move on. I got sick of philosophy club. But I refuse to move on. That's all. I'm just like, it's like, no, I want certain kinds of spaces and I'm not going to give up. That's all. But I know that it's not just like, oh, I've got the vision. No, I, this is a stab in the dark. And it's one that's going to hopefully encourage a lot of other people to take a stab, you know, in, in radical new unforeseen ways. And so, you know, but thank you. I, I, I will, I'll just take the compliment. Fucking thank you. I mean, the, the first philosophy club ever ended with, Socrates drinking hemlock so it's like it's a long tradition of people getting tired of philosophy clubs especially (laughs) (laughs) politicians Anne said this stream has been awesome so many great conversations yeah I actually am just so happy Anne has been able to make so much of it not only and then to be to do her first solo stream it's fucking epic Um, Nance how about you man It has been very, very strange and surreal. And uh, just to be in proximity to so many um, serious people, like people that I want to be near, I want to interact with, I want to um, spend time with and learn and grow alongside. Um, it's very awesome. Um, and yeah, the way today unfolded, there has been kind of... Uh, like an underlying theme, maybe unexpected, but also we probably should have expected it to be there um, all the time. Um, and it kind of, for me, it's like resisting categorization and and like a universal human experience. Like, um, and I don't think you can get this anywhere else on the internet. Yeah, I agree. Because we're doing like a bunch of stuff and it's like kind of keeping accountability like with exegetical stuff, whether it's video or like it's like discussion, um, the lecture courses. So it's like literally uh, the entire salad bar, like you got everything, you know, it's like the entire buffet. And, you know, it's not like a one trick pony. I still like see like I saw like today, like. You know, I'm not going to say their name, but, you know, a bunch of people po- like sharing like this influencers like uh, latest video about J.K. Rollins. Like, this is the hottest take. Like, who cares? Like, this is just freaking it's just influencer shit. Like, this is not philosophy. Right. Like, it's just clickbait. And like, it's just like you're always going to have them. But what are they going to do? But just attract followers like if you want to just consume content and just share it on IG and, and, and be like, oh, check out this content creator, that's fine. But if you want to actually find a medium where you could do theory and maybe one day either publish your stuff or just be a lifelong student or fellow traveler, like like to, to take a, a term out of Dave's book. And, and at the same time, you're going to like realize, oh, I don't really know shit, right? Stop doing comparative readings or be like, this sounds like this person this sounds like that it's like no we're actually doing philosophy which is like questioning your presuppositions right not just saying well i've read being in time once i've read totality of infinity once i've read das capital and actually let me tell you something it's like no that's not philosophy you're just regurgitating right our philosophy starts with a question do you know how to question do you know how to ask a question and you know that's the hardest thing 
the most simplest question that even I have time, a hard time doing because how long are my questions? Like five minute long <laughs> questions. But, um, you know, I think it's just so cool like to, to say like what Nick was like saying, like it's been almost a year, you know, and then like we are celebrating not only this, but like Nick and I are just like, we got this new intro. We just had a badass conversation with Isabel Millar. Um, that, that shit's popping. And we're excited to continue doing like more stuff. And yeah, I guess it's just like, it's an honor and a privilege to see even like, you know, you going with this from just theory plebe to, to, to being a part of this and then seeing Mikey do for they know not what they do. It's like, we did the fleece fader group and we were just like, like, you know, fantasizing like, man, imagine Mikey teaching this course, like, like yada, yada, yada. And then like, now it's happening. Right. And we're about to come up on being in time. Right. And so, uh, speaking of vanishing meteors, I think like if there is a real vanishing mediator, it's partially examined life because before any of the content creator and stuff like that, the only group that was like really putting stuff out there and created a group was that. And that's how you and Mikey met. Right. That's and right. because of that, now we're right here. <laughs> that's right. But like, you know, how this evolves and it's like, it's not no longer like content creator. It's literally like doing theory with different mediums that the content creators fail to take advantage of because they stay in the blind alleys of just, oh, the uh, content creator and consumer dichotomy. Based. I think that that is where to quilt it, really. Uh, with that, um, I just want to say shout out to Dan for that donation. And yeah. I'm also going to put up here on the screen the the final poster just to, to say look thank you to daniel tut and nina power for the conversation for actually for tearing with that negative and working through that shit i thought that was like a- admirable on both their parts and then um, really? you for, right seriously that was it was so good they christine louis is solely chris catrone cadell last uh todd mcgowan uh, Anne for Anne Splaining, which she the, her coinage Anne Splaining. I just love it that she got to do some of that today. Um, Nick Andrew, also for the people who hopped on earlier, like uh, to ask Todd questions, right? Um, what we had Luke, uh, Lucas and Matan and Adam. And uh, who, who else am I forgetting? Jordan. Jordan. Yeah. Um, and Anne's correct. It is a sausage party. But here's the thing, everybody. Um, you know, not only is this a, a space for obsessives, and just dudes are always going to overrepresent in obsessive spaces, um, but also, like, she's not just the token woman. You're all tokens. I'm sorry, I can't be friends with communities. I can't be fellow travelers with communities. I don't have fellow, no. Whatever your identity is, you're, you're, not, you're not really a token, but you know, you're, I'm sorry, I'm, I can't be friends with the community identity group. You're my friend or fellow traveler. That's all there is to it. And so everybody who is a part of Theory Underground is potentially open to being criticized as the token in, in some way. And, and that's, you know what, guess what, um, thinkers, we're not uh, overrepresented in big groups that like to brand themselves as communities. They're just not. And so we're all in, in our various ways um, occupying uh, positions of non-belonging. And this is not a space, a broad umbrella to bring together all the people who don't belong so that they can now have their special little identities of like, now I belong. I mean, I'll sell you the shirt, but it's not, you don't. And like, honestly, that's what the shirts would say. Theory Underground on the back, I don't belong here. Right? Like, um, but I really, and I don't either. I just really appreciate you all for associating and, and for bringing high level uh, thoughts, questions, concepts. And your question wasn't five minutes in word salad, Andrew, because you have like, you have gone from basically where everybody's at on Instagram to basically being like you've done a bachelor's at the university in a year you have rapidly accelerated and you are a lot you're 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 getting more succinct 
and 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 like like uh, precise. I think by the day. And your question right. today, your question today only lost me because I didn't hear the one word really that kind of tied. Oh, Marbert, yeah. yeah, yeah. But no, that was a fucking fire ass question, and uh, I just I just gotta say, like uh, I know that you got cut off at that conference for not being parsimonious with the time in your question. <laughs> You know fuck what? That guy. <laughs> fuck, fuck that guy. <laughs> he just wanted to go drink. Let's be honest. <laughs> that anyway. was funny because that was during Tut's uh, Tut's lecture too, and Tut was like in, like like enjoying the question too. But that dude was just like, "Let's be parsimonious." <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck that guy. Fuck that guy. <laughs> you better ne- you better never come around here. <laughs> but with that all said, I just gotta say today has been. Hi. And I hope people are going to take these courses. And with that, we're going to swap it out, roll the PSA, and I'll see you all really fucking early in the morning. Peace. And now a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. What follows is a description of Theory Underground, a thank you to its patrons, information about the upcoming tour, and three brand new courses that you might want to enroll in. Stay for the whole thing to get promo codes to save on those courses or information about the financial aid scholarship. Theory Underground is a philosophy lecture course gated social media site and publishing house by and for working class intellectuals and renegade academics. The subject matters dealt with at Theory Underground are the most important, yet neglected, for understanding ourselves, the world, and ways of possibly changing it. Because we have no corporate or state sponsors, only a small band of patrons, everything in this first year of operation helps immensely. Special thank yous to Bert, Nance, Marilyn, Carl, and Adam for your help in the $50 per month patron tier. If you want to help but the $50 cheer is too much, consider donating towards Meals and Gasoline via Venmo or PayPal. The Gasoline is for our countrywide tour of the U.S., where we aim to meet with supporters of this effort and do events to draw in new people who do not necessarily belong to marketing demographics predetermined by the attention economy. We will be giving lectures, leading discussions, and promoting several brand new books. Our goal is to only go to towns and cities where we have personal invitations from at least one person. We are doing this underground style, which for the hardcore punk scene in the US meant coming for long enough to get to know the area and do multiple events, not this modern treadmill of a new city each night in an attempt to maximize fame and profit. If you are interested in being a host, guide, or volunteer, then please fill out the form at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash us hyphen tour hyphen 2023 in an attempt to utilize the resources made publicly available we will be using libraries for most of our events so if you have a local library card and can reserve a space for us we would most appreciate it alternatively some of you might have access to pretty epic venue spaces just let us know ahead of time now for the courses The three upcoming courses are What is Sex, Digital Literacy and CMT, Critical Media Theory, and Being and Time. All courses at Theory Underground are available after the fact on demand, but some people get a lot more out of doing it live with a cohort. If you are looking to think deeply about the devices we have become reliant on while experimenting with new ways of reclaiming your attention span and relationship with yourself and others, then check out Digital Literacy and Critical Media Theory a course that is structured to combat the attention economy while strategically using some of its tools to help us gain a freer relationship to our devices. If interested, an introduction to this course will be shared at the end of this video. Just make sure to click on it. The lectures for this course take place on the second Sunday of every month for six months, starting in May. If you sign up at Tier 3, you also get access to the Recovery Group component, which also meets once per month. Enroll with promo code CMT Early Bird YT before May 13th for 20% off.
If you are frustrated by the discourse revolving around gender ideology, left and right, then join us in thinking deeper about sex. Cadell Last of Philosophy Portal is joining up with Theory Underground to teach Alenka Zupanchik's What is Sex? one of the most succinct and cutting-edge works of theory dealing with the topic. Zupanchik is one of the Slovenian circle's most incisive critics of both naive progressivism and reactionary tendencies when it comes to thinking about the relationship between sex, culture, and subjectivity. If interested, watch Three Reasons to Read What is Sex, which will be shared on screen at the end of this video. What is Sex begins in May and goes through June, meeting for four lecture sessions and, surprise, you will actually get to meet Alenka Zupanchik herself. Use promo code WHATISSEXEARLYBIRDYT before May 7th for 20% off. And just so you know, everybody, don't stress the capitalization. I just make it that way so it's more readable. It's not case sensitive. Being in time is one of the most notorious, profound, and difficult works of philosophy from the last 200 years. Its deconstruction of modernity and fundamental challenge to scientism is a prerequisite rite of passage for any thinker who wants to seriously engage with continental philosophy, social theory, or world change. In this course, you will learn about what Heidegger means by being, being in the world, Dasein, being unto death, and so many other crucial developments. But more important than all these buzzwords is just taking on this work itself and wrestling with the text. Doing so will rapidly accelerate your reading comprehension abilities and simultaneously challenge some of your most deep-seated presuppositions. As before, an introductory video to this course is shared on the end screen of this video or can be accessed from the links in the description. Being in Time Division 1 starts in June and ends July 22nd. Division 2 begins August 19th and goes through October. To sign up for Division 1 today, use the promo code BEINGINTIMEEARLYBIRDYT before the end of May for 20% off. If you feel obstructed by the cost of these courses, then we have good news. But before getting into the financial aid info, why are there even price tags at all, much less tiered pricing? First, because some people just want to audit, whereas others want constructive critical feedback or even one-on-one -on -one sessions. The tiers exist so that you can get the value you are seeking while compensating me, Dave, fairly for the time and energy required. Second, the prices set for these courses aim to make Theory Underground sustainable, meaning that it will bring in enough to pay for the costs of the operation, including my personal bills since I want to be a co-earner in the household when my soon-to-be wife and I start a family. <laughs> Thirdly, <laughs> Thirdly, People tend to take the things they pay for more seriously, and we want you to get the most out of this experience. With those reasons aside, we do not seek to exclude anyone who is struggling just to get by. We have a financial aid scholarship option for people who are currently between jobs or who live in a country on a cheap currency, like many of you who watch from Thailand, India, Mexico, or Poland. To name a few of the residents of some of the people who have already received financial aid scholarships in the last couple of months. Because I know what trying to study theory under the stresses of housing insecurity and poverty is like, the scholarship was set up during the first month of operation. Simply fill it out at https colon forward slash forward slash theory hyphen underground dot com forward slash scholarship. Last but not least, stay tuned for the Theory Underground app coming soon to an app store near you on your phone. Yeah, and seriously, thank you for listening or watching to this point. And uh, yeah. Thanks. We look forward to taking these courses with you. Bye.